It's Tuesday, January 23rd. I'm Adam Walsh. This is The Signal. Four candidates all focused on one seat, and some of the votes have already been cast. I'm talking about the provincial by-election in Conception Bay, East Bell Island. I've got four MHA hopefuls here with me in the studio to dive into the issues. And in addition to the regular radio land that this show occupies, we are also live streaming this on uh, cbc.ca slash NL. So if you're uh, at home or out and about not driving uh, and you've got your phone and you want to watch as opposed to just listen, you also have that ability today. So let me see. I'm going to go left to right. I'm like, this is my left, right? So we've got former head of the PC District Association and a Portugal Cove St. Phillips Town Council, Daryl Harding. How you doing? Best guy. How's yourself? Good, good. Then we've got PC candidate Tina Neary, a Portugal Cove St. Phillips Town Councillor. Hi. Hi. Uh, for the NDP, deaf rights advocate Kim Churchill. Hello again. Good morning. And someone who I've never met before, <laughs> for the Liberals, <laughs> who I have met before, obviously, advisor to the Premier, former broadcaster Fred Hutton. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Adam. How are you doing today? Not too bad. I was... Uh, good to see you. Good to see you, too. In this uh, winter uh, by-election season that we are in, I was checking my emails this morning, uh, and let me see the email. It's from the, not just to me, it was all media, from the Office of the Chief Electoral Officer. Advanced polls closed in the district of Conception Bay, East Bell Island at 8 p.m. yesterday evening, so January 22nd. In total... 1,734 votes were cast at the nine advanced polls in communities of Paradise, Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, and Wabana, uh, or Wabana, depending on how you pronounce it. The advance uh, poll ballots will be counted by, on by-election night and will be released along with the regular poll results after the polls close. Regular polls, of course, open Monday, January 29th, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So, what are you feeling I'll go in reverse order this time. What are you feeling at the door, door to door for buzz? We, we've got some votes in, which is, I mean, it's a healthy number. Fred? Um, if, if I may just take about 20 seconds just to, first of all, acknowledge the passing of Derek Bragg, our colleague. Yes, of course. If, if you, you don't could. mind. No, my, you know. And fellow candidates here. Um, yesterday was obviously a very difficult day for us. Um, he was very sick. We knew that this day would come, unfortunately. But having it happen yesterday, um, it... it, it it changed things a little bit for, for the day, for sure, yeah. I mean, and obviously going forward. So on behalf of everybody who worked with him, myself included, I want to extend our condolences to his wife, Beverly, childhood sweethearts, uh, and his daughter, Allison, and the uh, his pride and joy, Drew, who was his grandson. And, I mean, if you just look at his Facebook page, you can tell the, the smile on his face. So. I don't want to sidetrack everything here today with that, but it has obviously been heavy on our minds since yesterday. Yeah, it's a big thing. And I'll, I will say, you mentioned social media, right? Just yep. it, it's, I will use the word outpouring of just nice things being yep. said about that man from everyone. No, doesn't matter what the party is, uh, from, uh, you know, uh, uh, from his hometown to people he represented, anyone who, who was in touch with him that I've seen over uh, since, since yesterday, since the news broke. It's just been such an outpouring of, of just condolence yep. and just nice things. And if I may just take one more second, during the height of the crab situation last year, that is when he was first diagnosed, but he continued to fight on and he wanted to get that issue resolved. Resolved. Um, and uh, I mean, I could go on and on forever, but uh, again, just our condolences to his family and friends. I mean, he was before his time in politics, he spent 30 years as a volunteer firefighter and uh, town clerk in Greenspond. So there's definitely a dark cloud over, uh, over that part well, of the province and, and the whole province. And so. it's a reminder for all of us here, right? Like, we. <laughs> At the end of the day, we're all people in our communities yep. trying to do work, trying to support each other. And when you when you you hear about an early passing like this uh, and you think and you hear about all those connections, it is something that I think will hit everyone yep. and that everyone will just, I mean, offer obviously condolences. And, uh, and you know, there's a collective sadness around it. And, and he's two years in the difference in age for me. So, t again, our condolences and everybody has has expressed that from the other parties as well. And we appreciate that. The, the leaders have reached out. Uh, at the doors, uh, it's been a great response. Conception-based Bell Island is basically 
almost, you could say, three different districts because you yeah. have Belle Island, you have Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, where I am from, and you have a portion of Paradise, which was brought into it when there was a reduction of seats. So there are different issues for each one. To say that there is one specific issue, obviously everybody is talking about cost of living, everybody is talking about health care. But if you look at Paradise, the key there that people are asking about and talking about the, the high school, they want a high school, and traffic. And if you spend any time driving over there during uh, rush hour, it is incredible. It's huge growth, but the road is basically, in many respects, still the same. Conception-based Bell Island folks there at the door uh, want to um, have a health care clinic back in the community. So a family care team is something that's being discussed. And on Bell Island, obviously, the ferry is key and health care once again. So... You know, while it has been uh, great to reconnect with everybody, the one thing I'm also hearing from people is that Premier Fury lives in the district, I live in the district, and they would like the idea of having both on the government side. Kim Churchill, doors. What are you hearing as you go door to door? So, uh, and once again, you know, it's, it is it is different for the different areas. Bell Island, clearly their number one priority is, is a um, shore-based manager for the ferry. Um Without that, without that position being created, the ferry is a lifeline to Bell Island. So we'll never see any improvements in healthcare. We won't see any improvements in tourism. We won't see any improvements uh, in economic development. So that's the key issue there. Um, with regards to Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, and Paradise, I've been hearing the same echoing sentiments: childcare. It seems like I can't tell you how many mothers usually I've talked to who've told me they've actually had to quit their jobs because they could not find child care space for um, for their little one. And um, in fact, I talked to a doctor in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, who told me that her her clinic had been, has been impacted because the child care space that she has uh, opens later than it used to years ago, and it closes earlier than it used mm-hmm. to. So now she has to open her clinic later and close it earlier. And of course, that is impacting patient care. Tina Neary. Yeah, I mean, I echo the same thing as as uh, both Fred and Kim. We are hearing we are hearing those things as issues in Paradise. It, it's the high school in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips. It's the healthcare clinic, and Bell Island. It's it's the ferry service. But I think the difference is, and I think what some people are sharing, and where the confusion comes from, is is uh, you know these things were all in order before. Like the 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 high school was already slated in Paradise to to uh, to operate, and mm-hmm. it was canceled in 2016 um, when the Liberal government came in. And when we're looking at healthcare and our healthcare clinic, I mean, it's fantastic that individuals are, you know, we're all saying that we want it to come back, but the reality is, is it was taken away in 2018, and you know, now all of a sudden we have to respond and and um, you know do some damage control. So it's uh, hearing the very same things, you know, talking to teachers. Teachers are really, really. Uh, strained and fed up with what's happening with the education system. Um, everything in a circle, it's all something that definitely is is making really valid points. Daryl Hardy. Thank you. What I'm hearing at the doors and through the messaging that's coming to me, um, as my three colleagues have mentioned, um, there is a concern that people are not being heard on these issues. Some of the issues are long term. Um, some of them go back to a decade or more. In regards to the ferry issue on Bell Island, the shore-based manager is something as marine liaison under uh, the previous uh, PC government we were fighting to uh, to have in place. Uh, the uh, previous MHA, David Brazel, had uh, had me over there, and the plan was put in place. It was it was a matter of being done. Unfortunately, things happened differently in 2016. A big, uh, a big thing that I'm hearing in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, and Kim just touched on it as well. Outside of the fact that the um, that the clinic was already there, the public health clinic, and now we have to try to fight to get it back, is childcare. Hmm. So I reached out to the Federation of Co-ops to see if we could open up or have a conversation about a cooperative uh, style operation where the cost could be shared among the parents um, and uh, basically be owners of the the childcare. Uh, services in the in the area, and that's that's ongoing. Um, the the conditions healthcare wise on Bell Island are very very difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, they 
one thing that we initiated again in 2015 yeah, was... But, I'm, I mean, the question's still, like, you know, door-to-door, right? Because we can get into some of the past stuff, but it's like, what are, what are you hearing around from folks? Yeah. So, and, and, and just be mindful of time, just a few yeah. seconds left. I'm, I'm, I'm un- understood. But the conversation is around dialysis for the people on Belle Island. The ferry doesn't uh, make it very comfortable. People have to go to St. John's, whether yeah. it's by taxi or by ambulance. So we're hoping to get a couple of uh, dialysis seats over there. People need to be heard. They're being heard by all the candidates here, and we have to create a hub. We have to have the spokes of a wheel. All these concerns need to be addressed. For yourself specifically, right, running as an independent candidate, there's a couple of things uh, that I know you will have addressed already in the media, mm-hmm. but that I want to just get through. There's a question at the end of this, but mm-hmm. if there's ne- if a correction is needed, please correct me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I said you're running as an uh, independent candidate. You used to head the Conception Bay East uh, Bell Island District Association. You resigned from that post last month, saying the nomination process for this by-election was a fair and open process. You accused leader Tony Wakeham of choosing one of his supporters as the candidate. Uh, there's also a, a letter that you wrote to the party about this. You have said that was uh, private party dealings. Uh, there's that. Then, in addition embroiled in a dispute with your own town council, suspended last March after an external investigation found multiple people uh, allege you harassed or sexually harassed them. And another investigation found you breached the town's code of conduct for soliciting donations from local residents through a GoFundMe campaign after being injured in a car crash. Now, I said, the first bit, you said it's party <laughs> politics, and you know, it's meant to be private. The second mm-hmm. two, uh, there's a court, there are court processes that Absolutely. are ongoing, and you've said that, you know, you have, you've get to let that play out mm-hmm. and you can't uh, talk about it now. That's My right. question for you, how do you expect voters to vote for you when the full details won't be out by election day and they've got to make a decision now? Um, very good question. And um, the challenges of being an independent, progressive, conservative candidate in an election are not minuscule. They're significant. This one uh, is even more significant. The hurdle to get over Um, the procedures and have uh, policy and a process followed to find resolution in um, the two actions of council Mm -hmm. um, and uh, have have gone to the Supreme Court. There were no ways for me to appeal uh, the decisions. So I had to go to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court handles everything from two neighbors fighting over a fence post to murder. And unfortunately, with delays along the way, the process has, well, March 1st now is the next date that we will, that we will uh, be in front of the judge. However, two weeks ago, the, um, the judge did accept our position of having all information, both reports on both cases with the town, entered into the public record. So now, instead of having a shroud of ev- of the evidence, whatever, it's out there. And okay. people can go to the public record and see. Okay, thank you for that. Tina Neary, you you want to fill David Brazel's seat, right? Yes. Former party leader, <clears throat> MHA, for 14 years. Yes. How do you expect to deliver things for your district that he could not? Well, I think a lot of it is going to be relative to the support that's received. I mean, you know, as the opposition, there's only so much that you can do. So, you know, uh, MHA Brazel did the best that he could with what he had and the resources that were available and beyond that. So for myself personally, it's it's a matter of just continuing, uh, you know, with the legacy he's left behind, continuing to fight and advocate for what's necessary and showing, uh, you know, the residents of the district that I am committed to this. I have been for a number of years to get to this point and and that's all we can do is, is, is you know, it's not like, yay, my best, but Really, it's it's. Well, there's, uh, yeah, there's a realistic, yeah. the reality of how politics and government right. and, and governing works, right? The, you, like you're trying for a seat that will be in the opposition. It's That's not. Right. It's not the government. Okay, uh, Kim Churchill, you framed yourself as a new choice, but what can you actually do as an MHA for a third party that last time around did not even run a full slate of candidates? So. You know, this is uh, this is an opportunity for people who are frustrated, who are fed up with government, uh, who are fed up with a representative that was not a strong opposition to hold government accountable, to make changes in the district, uh, to give NDP an opportunity. Um, you know, this is, I've already proven myself that I'm a fighter. I've already proven myself that I have the perseverance and the drive to go 
up against the two biggest entities in this province, something that no one else has ever done. And uh, that took a lot of energy. It took a lot of uh, hard work. And um, and I'm proud to say that I did it. And, you know, the end outcome was that I won. People recognize that. They recognize the fact that I am an authentic advocate. Hmm. I am somebody who has been an advocate my entire life. I I worked in the third, the nonprofit sector, and that is when my fighting and my advocacy began professionally. Fred, Fred Hutt, uh, here's a quote. Tell me if uh, it's accurate. <laughs> when I am your MHA, I will be able to pick up the phone and call <laughs> the transportation minister and say, quote, these roads need to be done in this year's budget and they will be done. Uh, that's from a CBC article. Uh, mm-hmm. Is this how the Fury government makes its decisions? No, obviously. I mean, uh, Look, if you're part of the government, you obviously have more time, face time with ministers. You, you just that's that is not the way it's done. But I can so tell you. Why'd you say it though? <laughs> well, I mean, it was it, it, we had a two-hour-long session on Bell Island. I said it there, and I know it was tweeted about afterwards and talked about. The way it works, there is a criteria process of what is actually needed. I have driven on Bell Island more frequently recently because my wife's family's from there. We do some summer trips over, whatever. Uh, but the road conditions are deplorable. There has been no real work done there in about 15 years. Uh, there was some work done about 10 years ago or so, uh, 11, something like that. But there are some serious problems over there and deficiencies. And that was what I was referring to was Bell Island. Uh, they haven't had any work done in a long time. There has been work done in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, a lot. Uh, the road I live on, Old Broad Cove Road, was e- extensively paved and while Dave Brazel was the MHA for the area and Bennett's Road and parts of Thorburn Road. So opposition, and last year a school was announced for Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, an opposition uh, held district. The way it works is that there is a criteria of what needs it the most. And the Department of Transportation Infrastructure will go through that. But I have driven on the roads over on Bell Island. They are, some of them are uh, literally unsafe. There's a part of Portugal Cove Road leading from Murray's Pond down to the campaign headquarters, which everybody coming down says, wow, there's a couple of rim busters there. You got to, like the whole part needs to be done, the shoulder. It's unsafe. Speed in the uh, (coughs) district is is an issue. What can't, what we did do was about two months ago, uh, the premier met with the, uh, the town council on Bell Island. There were some other issues brewing. So he went over and met. There's 34 paved roads of 34 kilometers of paved road on Bell Island. They want about three and a half kilometers paved. I said to them, I would advocate on their behalf to do it. I'd be able to talk to uh, you know the minister and and put the plea in for that. I should add as well, like if you are an MHA on the government side, you get about a half an hour to 40 minutes. The premier goes in every morning at about seven o'clock and every week we alternate through and I was in the meetings as his advisor all the MHAs who were on the government side. And you can talk about whatever you want. If you're a government member, you get that one-on-one FaceTime with the Premier in a cycle-through basis of the 21 MHAs. You don't get it when you're an opposition member. Anyone else with any thoughts on this? Or the like? just th- this specific focus here on Bell Island, talking about the road conditions and any other of the number of other issues that well, you've Well, Paradise and up. Portugal Cove, St. Phillips have the same, the same have some pretty Paradise. bad issues, too, with, even just with to, respect to pavement. To zone in on Bell Island here, uh, any thoughts or, or for anything else uh, that uh, Fred Hutton just brought up? I'd like to remind everyone that uh, Premier Fury is, actually resides in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, in this district. And, uh, you know, I, one of the things I'd like to know is how many people in this province actually received a personalized brochure from the Premier touting about all the great things that has happened in the, their district, because I know the people in our district did right before Christmas. I wonder why. Hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, and I would just like to to mention the same along from the Bell Bell Island perspective. Um, That's I've heard a lot from individuals on Bell Island about the fact that they these are the needs that have been going on for a long time. This didn't just happen in the last you know thirty to sixty days, and so why is it that it's so important now to uh, to the Liberal government, to the Fury government, to uh, have this stuff taken care of when it could have been taken care of in the you know last decade or so that they've been in power? So that's always been a question that I'm hearing and, and have and, and myself am, am somewhat confused about. Daryl Hart. Uh, yeah, very good, uh, very good conversation so far. I'd like to question 
when the premier is supposed to listen to all of the people of the province and he affords a special meeting for his own MHAs, why he doesn't listen to the people in the rest of the province by affording those MHAs a half hour in the morning or the afternoon or the evening or the night. When they ask for it, when, when they request it, they get it. Yeah, when, uh, when they... Um, when the liberals uh, are trying to be the government for the people or whatever government is for the people, it's supposed to be for all of the people. And it'd be interesting to know uh, exactly um, the thoughts of other MHAs, including the independents, um, how many of them have been given this regular audience with the premier. I want to interject as well because... One of the things that, uh, with regards to the road infrastructures, um, the Auditor General actually called for a centralized road maintenance database as far back as 2017. And as far as we know, they still haven't created it seven years later. The Liberals are going to be celebrating their five-year roads plan and have quoted unprecedented spending on highway upgrades and maintenance. But it's not transparent. That's the issue. And we need to have transparency because otherwise we don't know if roads are being done for political gain. So one of the things that they wanted to do a five-year plan, uh, Adam, is, and it's $1.4 billion somewhere in that range. There's 9,000 kilometers of paved road in Newfoundland and Labrador. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of road. And, and there's several thousand unpaved that have to be graded or upgraded with the, with the gravel and what have you. Uh, on a yearly basis, and it's done on a needs, and opposition MHAs get the same opportunity to put forward their pleas to the Transportation and Infrastructure Minister on what roads need to be done. They put it in on a priority basis. I mean, I'm not part of that discussion, uh, you know, in terms of what roads actually get decided upon, but there's a certain grid and criteria that they go through to figure out what needs to be done. Having a plan, a five-year plan, was something that was done in conjunction with the contractors because... They were always waiting until the last minute to find out what was going to get done. Our construction season in Newfoundland and Labrador is extremely short Mm -hmm. because it's based on the weather and the geography of getting the equipment from, say, from St. Anthony down to Port of Asque or whatever contract. So then for the folks who have been waiting this whole time Mm -hmm. uh, in the district you're trying to represent, and and this is a... Again, what is your message to them who have been just, they've been waiting? Well, uh, I I don't know what advocacy David Brazel had been doing or the former MHA. So I, I can't tell you well, why. Well, you can why. appreciate that, <clears throat> excuse me, that he has obviously been advocating for everything. Uh, you know, when I go through to the doors, I'm hearing that very loud and clear. And that's why I'm getting the support that I am, because everybody is connecting me to the endorsement I've received from from MHA Brazel, who uh, has been stated as as doing more for the people than anybody that they can recall in a number of years. So to say that, it, it you know, that, you don't know about that. Fred doesn't know about the uh, the advocacy that's taking place. If this is what's needed, and we know that it is, that's why we know that it is. <clears throat> Excuse me, because he has been pushing very hard for the people and their needs in all of the district. Tina Neary, what's at stake for this for your for for the PC party? Because a long time seat. What's at stake here for you for a by election? For me personally, well, for the for the party. Well, you know, this is something that I've uh, I've put my mind to for a long time. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to decide if this is what I wanted to do. Um, You know, I've been talking about this since I've been in municipal council since 2017, talking about it since 2019. So, I mean, you know, it's been a, it's been a PC district for almost 20 years. So of course that, that in itself is what's at stake in the sense of the individuals in the district who have been very supportive of a PC, um, of the PC party and a PC seat. So it is very important to me to be able to uh, to win this seat and continue with the legacy that David Brazel has left behind and continue with the strong tradi- tradition, excuse me, of, of PC government in the, in the district, in the area. If you don't win, what do you think it says about faith in the opposition, the, the new leader, right, Mr. Wakeham, uh, what, what, what do you think the message will be? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to the confusion that's had with the individuals in the district or even in the province. I mean, you know, we've heard a lot of conversation about, I mean, sure, when I first started going to the doors, I was hearing that they were surprised that I was, uh, they didn't realize that there was two PC candidates because, you know, the, the liberal candidate was uh, was visiting doors and talking about his relationship with with uh, uh, former MHA Brazel, and so they were confused to, to see me come along because they thought in the beginning that uh, 
that Fred was the PC candidate, actually. So I, I think it's just a matter of confusion, and it's going to be about education and awareness as to what our leader, Tony Wakeham, is going to plan to invest when we form government into this province based on all of the messaging that he's been giving over, uh, you know, all of his interviews, etc. cetera. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot that needs to be done, and there's a lot of change that needs to be made, and I think the people are ready for that change. Uh, mm. So, you know, okay. it, it, it's necessary absolutely to give, uh, to have this seat and give uh, the PC party the opportunity to continue and to form stronger government than what we're experiencing now. Daryl Harding, I can't ask that question to you because you're running as an independent, so there's nothing at stake for your party. But my question to you is, wh- why are you like, why are you running? Because you, you've told me before, and you've said in the media that you, you see yourself, you're an independent, but you see yourself, your politics as PC. So what do you think this means for your the former party you're attached to and your whole role in all of this? Yes. Um, Great question. And it's one that every door, every phone call, and every social media uh, message that I put out, I'm perfectly clear. I need to describe myself in the best, clearest way that I can to the people that are going to make a decision in this by-election. And some have said, why are you saying you're a progressive conservative? Hmm. Because I am progressive. I am conservative in my policy, in my code of ethics, and in my core values. I, those people that know me throughout the district, throughout the province, know who Daryl Harding is, but I take the extra step of explaining to everybody the whole process. I am not the Progressive Conservative Party candidate for PCNL. That candidate is running their own campaign, giving this same information at their doors that And when you go into the ballot box, when you go into that booth by yourself, the progressive conservative NL candidate, excuse me, is identified. And across from Daryl J. Harding, there is no identification Mm. because that's the way that it is. I'd like to also just uh, go back to uh, when you asked me the last question. I was a little bit interrupted there. But, Fred, in all due respect, you said other other MHAs can get the ears of the uh, premier as well. You finished your statement by saying if you're not in government, you don't get that. So it's either or. I mean, you can't you can't say both. The other thing is when you're talking about roads plan of five years, none of this is new. Uh, Kim makes a very good point about the brochure put out by the government governing party just before the the uh, resignation of the MHA. All of this does not leave a good taste in my mouth or a lot of people at the door's mouth of the double talk. So this is an opportunity here for people in the district to speak to the people that they want to speak to in regards to my colleagues and myself here. Ask the questions. Ask those hard questions. Well, why this? Well, why that? And if you're not getting a clear answer, that should help you change your mind or make up your mind for who you're going to support. Fred, what's at stake for your party? Uh... I, I'm not really thinking about that, and, but I would like to just address the brochure. The brochure was paid for by the party, not by the uh, not by the uh, taxpayers. Um, and if you're if you become an MHA, you do have a constituency allowance to put out those kinds of brochures on a, in a yeah. quarterly or half year basis. I'm not exactly sure what the uh, what the budget is, but it, it so that any MHA in any of the 40 districts can communicate to their uh, to their constituents. But the premier is not the MHA exactly. for our district. Exactly. <clears throat> and I'm sorry that I might add, again, it brings me back to the confusion about why. I mean, it's fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm loving hearing that all these wonderful things are going to happen. They're not accurate. In our province. Mm-hmm. However, why has it not happened up until now? Why all of a sudden, when it's time to go out there and, and get the votes and secure a seat, why does this become now so important? And all of these things are suddenly magically going to happen, and all of these promises are being made yet again, but nothing that has been talked about has taken place in the last decade. So that's a, that's a confusing uh, issue for people, and that is what I'm hearing, and it is very difficult to answer because... As Kim just said, it's not accurate, it's not. and we don't have the proper information to give. So we are just as much in the dark about what's going to happen next as, as anybody else is, based on what the reports are being I think given. it's very clear yep. what's going to happen, and the Premier is constantly updating people on his plans for the future with the party. And with respect to what's at stake, um, you know, it's... <laughs> 
I've lived in that community my, pretty much my entire life. I've been in, out, in and out a bit to go to school. And my parents have had a place there. My grandparents, you know, we've got strong family connections down there. I'm passionate about the community itself. I've worked closely with the council in my years as a broadcaster and volunteering time to host events, whatever else. And to be connected to to my community that way. I know a lot of people out there. When I can, I shop out there. We don't have the same kind of infrastructure that the city has in terms of supermarkets or whatever. And I'm, I, I just I want to be part of it. I've, I've watched over the last four years what an MHA has to do, separate from what I've witnessed as a journalist. And I feel that I can bring what I know about what needs to be done in the community and what the community wants together to mesh. Somebody asked me, like, what's the difference between being a reporter and an MHA? And I, I answered this the night I launched my campaign. There is no real difference in so much as when your life is going right, nobody is calling reporters or MHAs. Yeah. When they need help, they call. And I've done that through 30 years as a journalist in trying to get people's stories out to shine light on issues that need to be, you know, fixed or helped moved along, and the same can be said for what an MHA does to guide and them through, if I could, through the halls of government. Sure, quickly, I'll get back to Kim Churchill. Go ahead. With, with all due respect as well, though, I, I've heard, you know, I've spent the last four years uh, watching what it's like to be an MHA and being involved. Um, and I guess from my end, I look and I think, you know, you know, you, Fred didn't go in as a, as a junior staff. You know, he didn't get brought in as uh, in the no, beginning as, an as an individual who's learning. He came in as a senior advisor sure. to the premier. Mm -hmm. So now here we are four years later and all of a sudden, again, magically, it's these things are all going to happen. The, the concept from our end, quite frankly, is that we the reaction, the reactivity, it needs to stop. We need to start being by far more proactive. And there has been time resources and energies there to be able to do that over this last decade. And it simply has not happened. Kim Churchill, you're going to say something, and then I'll ask a similar question about what's at stake for your party. Sure. Um, so a, a few things there. The brochure, just to get back to that, it comes down to a, a point of misrepresenting, misleading the public about information that directly impacts them. So government has touted that they're way ahead of child care by years, but they're not telling the public that only 358 spaces have been made available, or, or 258, one of those numbers, okay. sorry, 358. Uh, and there's 6,000, 6,000 families are waiting for child care. And, um, you know, there was also a mention of a number of doctors being recruited. The problem is they're not telling people how many doctors have actually left. And that brings me to my point. I just left a press conference that I just had before I came here. And I can tell you there was 115 doctors in the health system that have resigned. Hmm. There are 1,275 vacancies on, in the Eastern Health Region alone. And there's 1,009 resignations in Eastern Health. Now, when is the province going to tell the public the actual truth of what is happening with health care in our region? And those are just, like I said, Eastern Health. With regards to the stakes, what's at stake here? Look, the NDP, they are a small but mighty group of people. They have done an awful lot for the people of this province. In fact, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have the the brightly shine light on house, housing crisis that we're all um, seeing happening. We wouldn't have uh, attention paid to pay equity. And uh, we certainly have wouldn't be having a dialogue on the travel nurses and the costs of uh, privatization. Um, over and over and over again, we're seeing the NDP have this history of highlighting failures that the government is doing and providing the solutions to that. What's at stake, to answer that direct question, are the people in this province, their very lives are what at st is at stake here, okay? I, I didn't come down this road to go into politics. That wasn't my lifelong dream. I'm here because of what I went through, what I was put through, my family was put through. I seen how government tries to wear you down, tries to break you to the point where you quit and give up and walk away. I've had Mr. Hutton in my backyard with Andrew Fury at the time, who was a leadership candidate. And they were both there listening to me plead and beg about my deaf child being discriminated against. As soon as the election was called and was over with, Andrew Fury becomes premier. Fred Hutton goes in to become a special advisor. Guess what? We're ghosted. Okay. That's that, what happens when an election's over. And if you have uh, to add to that, mm -hmm. if you had to add to that, uh, Kim has just shared the numbers relative to health care. Let's take a look at everything else that is always in discussion but has now become crisis. We could have the same statistics that come out about the number of housing units that are not available or that are available. But, but And I'm going to throw something back know? at you, though, before I go back to Fred Hutton here. 
what would be different under a PC government? Because there is one thing about Newfoundland politics. It tends to always kind of feel like it's the same. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, and like, would the PCs be doing anything differently than what the Liberals are doing right now? Is listening. there a plan for this? We'd be listening. We'd be having a plan. You know, somebody mentioned in one of our uh, sessions together about a contingency plan. They said they haven't heard about the contingency plan. They haven't heard because there isn't one. So what we'd be doing different is absolutely, it's almost like having to start a, start over with a new business. You know, take mm-hmm. a look at all of the taxes and all of the fees that are in place and what is necessary and what is frivolous and what is it that we need to eliminate immediately to be able to start putting the money back into the pockets of the Newfoundlanders and Labradorians that are being affected, right? So we have we have a leader who uh, has come from, uh, you know, a career of, of background in healthcare and who has spoken to the media and to the people regularly to tell them what his plans are. Hmm. And from my end, that is what is so incredibly important and why I'd like to be there when we form government to be able to follow through on all of these things that are being brought forward and eliminate the statistics that are being shared because it's not acceptable. Fred, a lot a lot has been said. Uh, uh, to give you a chance to respond. I, I, I would like to, seeing we can come back oh, this way. Sure. In regards and then to, I'll go over to yeah, Fred Hyde. Sure. Uh, thank you. Appreciate Appreciate that. Um, as an independent, uh, I'm not asked the question of what the impact is on my party. Uh, however, I will tell you what the impact is or can be on the province. As an independent seat in the in the House of Assembly, um, in a very closely contested provincial election coming up, because this is a dressed rehearsal for what's going to happen in six or eight months' time, an independent seat. Uh, While I don't get a chance to speak in the House, the impact is I can speak to the media every single day, and then the people can speak to the government, and they're listening to tens of thousands instead of one. However, when an independent uh, person is is, uh, courted by a government party or an opposition party about a different platform that they want to bring forward or a different plan that they have, and they're looking for support in that in the House, then my vote as an independent PC candidate for uh, conceptual-based Bell Island becomes very valuable because mm-hmm. then I haul out my piece of paper and I say, well, if I'm going to support you here, my people in my district need this. And that gives me a great bargaining power. In regards to approachability by the government, and Kim, bless your heart, you're 100% right, the, the misinformation and the misdirection uh, in the pamphlet was, was immense. I'm a town councillor in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, as is uh, candidate Neri. And we can't even get a response from the uh, provincial government when it comes to an email that we send from our council about the conditions of roads in our town, about the conditions of the ditching in our town. So while that was all great, it was smoke and mirrors to have that pamphlet put out. It was a political move to get put out. And let's call a spade a spade. Let's be perfectly honest because we're all honest here. That was to help in a by-election, which is a dress rehearsal for the next election, which will be before Christmas. Mark my words. Independent candidate candidate Daryl Harding. Thank you, Fred Hutton. I'll go back to you. Uh, right. Any thoughts on uh, any of what's being said? So right in terms of what's been done for the people of the province as a whole, not just the residents of Conception Bay East Bell Island, let's start with $5.2 billion in rate mitigation for Muskrat Falls a deal that was signed by a previous administration. Now, you can whatever happened is there, we have to deal with it. I'm not interested in going back and hashing it out, Churchill Falls, Muskrat Falls, whatever. But we did know that your power rates, everyone's power rates at this table, and everyone in Conception Bay East of Bell Island, and everyone across the province, their rates were going to double mm-hmm. without that $5.2 billion. It's $190 million a year that has to go on it. Okay, let's go to uh, your home insurance. The tax was taken off that. Understanding that there's a cost of living issue, a crisis if you will, for many people. That's gone. That costs millions of dollars. Take the tax off the home insurance. Cut the cost of uh, registering your car in half from 160 to 80. Doesn't sound like a lot, but you add it to everything else. Increase the uh, income support supplement for people, low-income folks. Increasing the spending on housing. The $1.4 billion for uh, infrastructure and roads and bridges and tunnels and all the culverts that need to be so, replaced. And I, I think all these issues cost a lot of money. When you're, and there needs to be a bigger vision, a bigger plan to do it. 
Sure. There, and, and there are others. The, the nutritional supplement for down, mothers though, up to five if years you're, old. If you're an advisor for, for the premier or you're with the governing yep. party or you're trying to be elected as a, as a member with the governing party, mm-hmm. any it doesn't matter what era of politics in this province we go to, anyone can sit down and do what you're doing, right, for that list there of, like, here's the spending, mm-hmm. here's the spending, mm-hmm. here's the spending. But there is a point uh, that was brought up about government and transparency. And, right. and it, like, we'll get the press releases, right? The announcements will come out and say, like, hey, here's all this. But then, uh, like Kim was mentioning there, what about... She mentioned the honesty around it, and I wonder if mm-hmm. you could talk about that. If when well, you, look, when, when you like, hear about vacancies, but all you're hearing about is like, here's what we vacancies did. in healthcare. Yeah. There's vacancies in healthcare across Newfoundland and or across Canada, yeah. or around the globe. Everybody is talking about it. I mean, I've spent the last four years or three and a half years with uh, uh, people who are in similar positions in other provinces, mm-hmm. talking to them, and they are de- dealing with the same thing. Tom Osborne, the health minister, was on the other day. Uh, I think the number of nurses. There's been a recruitment of around four. It may be between three and four hundred. I'm not exactly sure on the number. Some have left as well. So the balance is kind of the same. There's been about 80 doctors who've come to, to Newfoundland and Labrador. There will be a continuation of people who retire as a result of it. Aggressive recruitment, increase in the, size, the, the capacity for the medical school. Not going to bring a doctor here tomorrow, but it's going to bring some who are training away from home. Targeting the recruitment to places like India, where they're trained so that they can come here and go to work and not have to come here and train again. Being more specific in the in the recruitment of people who can come to Newfoundland and start work tomorrow. It's it's a huge, huge um, focus of the Department of Health, just the Department of Health. Tina Neary, I saw you first. Go ahead. Uh, yes, absolutely. That's wonderful if that's all happening. However, it brings me to see what's happening over the last number of days where we're talking about the importance of health care and how it's being recognized by our premier and how it's important to do the recruitment and retention. However, we have a group of individuals out there the allied health professionals who are being ignored, who are being disrespected, who are simply asking for equal pay for equal work, and it's not happening. And they're out protesting, trying to save their jobs, trying to just simply ask for what's necessary, and they're being ignored as well. And so this would be, I would think, a prime time to be able to step up, get them to the table, talk about what's necessary and what's needed, because it's not just doctors and nurses. These folks, you know, there's 29 different professions in, in within AHP. They also keep things running for people. They're also the ones that are out there when things are happening and the doctors are diagnosing. These are the people that are coming forward and offering the services and support that's required. So what happened What happened there? Why is it that we can't get, uh, you know, we can't get them to the table to get what's necessary? And uh, and they have to, they have a fight on their hands as well, like everything else we're talking about. Kim Churchill first, then then Daryl Harding. Again. So I, I, one thing we keep hearing about is recruitment, 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 recruitment. I want to know when is the government going to actually recognize the fact this is not a recruitment issue, this is a retention issue. The problem what people are resigning is because they are fed up with the way they are being treated, and more specifically mistreated by government. It's they're. They're working in harsh conditions. If these people are seeing and working in the same conditions that we are seeing in healthcare, and they're living it day to day, why would they stay? This is literally an A-tip that I did on the vacancies and the resignations. And I mean, you can see like the list just goes on and on and on of all different professionals. We're at a point now where if we lose another respiratory person, we're not going to have people that are going to be there to help with cancer patients. It's this is a this is literally a crisis as we've been we've been saying, and it's time that the government actually steps up, starts doing the hard work, and does the right thing for the people of this province. Daryl Harding, you wanted to say something. Yep, I uh, I was listening to Fred and uh, and uh, all the, this money is going here and this money is going there. Fred, that's the people's money. The Liberal Party, any government doesn't do anything with money. You're not paying for it yourself. You're collecting it from us. Now, you may redirect it here and redirect it there, but ultimately every nickel that Premier Fury has put in his information package about future spending, future improvements, future this and future that, is not liberal money. It belongs to the taxpayers. It comes from the taxpayers. We are paying for that, and and governments supposedly led uh, take that and leverage it for more monies. The taxpayer in Newfoundland and Labrador is overwhelmed with the taxes, not the least of which is this carbon tax, which we'll get into hopefully a little bit later. Sugar tax. It's a federal um, tax. There's a, it's a federal sugar tax. tax. Uh, there's a tax on sugar. Now there's talks of a fat tax. Um, whatever it happens, whatever it comes down to, guys, who's listening to this out in Radioland, the people that are offering you here uh, their thoughts and 
their ideas, they have good points. However, they're bound by an agenda of a, par- of a leader or of a party or of a political plan, which they have very little, if any, say in. An independent candidate, I have one agenda. That agenda is you. And just like I pointed out that you're paying for every but service in this town, candidate, I'm not finished yet. Right? As 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 the as the independent candidate, I look after your interests, and it's your dollars that's doing all of these things, not some magical money be given being given by a political party, whether it's a federal or provincial party. No, far away. Do, do, do you <laughs> actually think you can win this as as an independent candidate who who's saying, well, my politics are PC when it's a Tory? It's been a Tory seat for two decades. It's been blue. Are you not just vote splitting and allowing uh, perhaps uh, the, the the governing liberals to? to Wonderful the question, and I'm I'm thinking that I like that you like my questions today. But yes, but listen, it's, <laughs> uh, there's no such thing as a bad question. <laughs> and in order to there you go. get the message out yeah. there, I have to be able to answer those. Yeah. So that's wonderful. Um, when I say that I'm a progressive conservative person, it doesn't mean that I'm running under the PC banner, as I've already explained. No, but your infrastructure, I mean, you've worked... My infrastructure from and my background party. has been helping people. Okay. It, my whole life, uh, I originated from a broken home. The oldest of six, five siblings, 11 years old, and was forced with my mom... Mm-hmm. To become a father of five instead of looking forward to the dream of being a teenager. I have helped people and I have been helped by people my whole life. Everybody that knows Daryl Harding knows my story, understands where I come from. The power of an individual seat is not just the person. It's the power of the people behind that person. Thank you, Daryl Harding, for that. Cost of living. What, on top of everything that's being done, what else should be done? to make a difference for people now? Tina? Well, the PC Party absolutely intends to index seniors' benefits. That is one of the large uh, areas that they're looking at as far as seniors. I mean, we have seniors that are, you know, 50% Using, excuse me, using food banks, 50% more. Seniors, what about social assistance broadly? I'm sorry? So that's seniors, but what about broadly with social assistance? Would you Uh, index that to inflation? I think that's, you know, again, that's part of what would need to be explored relative to taxes and fees that are taking place. I think that's something that is absolutely on the table to be considered. Um, You know, and excuse me, cost of living, it's really about... All of these extra taxes that have just been mentioned in, uh, in, what, in what everybody else around the table is saying. So we eliminate the taxes that are not necessary. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with... But spending uh, more and then eliminating taxes, like, m- well, like you, the math you, on that's not great, right? Right. But you, you have to find... You have to use your resources that are there. And you have to find ways. I mean, you know, just looking at the economy in general. You know, the, the more money we give back to people, the more money is going to be spent in the economy, which is going to allow for increase in small businesses and increase in revenues in other areas. So revenue sources are there. It's just a matter of having to, you know, locate them and understand how to be able to implement them. Kim Churchill. So one of the things that the NDP have been um, advocating and, and, and asking from government for is to take off the provincial tax of home heating. So that's all forms of home heating, whether it be furnace, oil, electric, et cetera. Um, of course, we want to see one of the things that we always want to do for, for people in the province is put money back into your own pocket. And in a time where there's crisis, uh, where everybody is trying to stretch the dollar and make ends meet, and a lot of people are just not reaching it. Um, this is a time when that, something as simple as that can be done. And if government really cared about the people in this province, they could actually walk in tomorrow, 9 a.m., and make this happen. It was something that was actually available years ago. We, we put pressure uh, when the PCs were in party uh, in government, and um, they came to the table and they made that and they offered that, but then when the Liberal Party came back into government, they removed it. Fred Hutton, cost of living. So um, I know I, I, others have said I shouldn't talk about all the things that have been done, but eight cents taken off the gas tax was done to offset the carbon tax, which I am against. The carbon tax is a federal tax. It's really designed for a place like Montreal or Toronto or Quebec City or Vancouver where people can get on a subway. If you live in St. Phillips, you cannot get on a bus and leave your truck or your car or your motorcycle at home. So you have to use that form of transportation to get somewhere. That was something we've all been talking about over the last few days in in various forms that we've attended. 
We don't have any public transportation out in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips. The ferry is another issue, obviously, unto itself. Paradise has some busing service. We need that. So the carbon tax, eight, a little over eight cents a liter on gasoline was taken off to help people with the cost of living. There's also uh, programs so that you can get mini splits put into your house and stop having to use oil and programs where it basically th- there's, there's no cost. You don't even have to use the money up front because the companies will come after the government for money. All right, everyone, you've got under a minute left. Hold on, uh, you didn't ask me about that question. C- quickly, uh, 30 seconds. I will, well, I will state this when it comes to social uh, supports and cost of living. Um, everybody who pays taxes gets a benefit of those taxes in one way or another. I support a universal allowance. I support the fact that those that are requiring social services that are unable to work for those social services should not meet the poverty line. Why would we want someone to meet the poverty line? We need to exceed the poverty line, and they be supported. Those that are working and able to work would take part in a program to help increase the revenue for that. Everybody's talking about carbon footprints. Does anybody know how much of our atmosphere is carbon dioxide? 0.04%. percent 30 seconds for your final point of the day, because we're running out of time. I want to get to everyone. Last 30 seconds to you for your point uh, to end with, please. Guys, I won't be quiet. I will speak for you. Um, Don't let people tell you that an independent candidate is not a successful or a practical way of governing. It certainly is. Support me. I'll bring all of the issues to the media, and I'll make sure that my one agenda is you, not a leader, not a party, not a political platform, my one agenda is is you. Thank you uh, for that, independent candidate Daryl Harding. Uh, PC candidate Tina Neary. Absolutely. I just want to remind of the need for us to be proactive and not reactive. I think very quickly about one of the comments that was made, and I just I, I wanted to mention it earlier, but there's a lot of conversation now coming from the sitting government about the fact that all of these things are going to happen once, uh, if they are elected to this seat. I just am wondering if they are in power now, why it is that the premier isn't actually acting on those things now. Like a shore-based manager, they're going to put out an, uh, an ad right away, a job description right away when this is all over. Why not do it now? They have the opportunity to do that. Very quickly about myself, I've said it many times, people that know me know. I am a fighter, I am a people before politics person, and I will fight everything, every day, for the people of this district. NDP candidate Kim Churchill. We have seen how government has ignored the residents of Bell Island, gave a knee-jerk reaction to the homeless, have forgotten seniors who are on fixed incomes, and created additional stress to families with young children and made life exponentially more difficult for people with disabilities. Under a PC rep in our district, things did not improve. You and your family deserve better. Really, it comes down to, excuse me, three, asking three questions to the people of this district. Has your child care gotten better? Has your access to health care improved? Are you able to make ends meet? And specifically to people on Bell Island, has your ferry service improved? If no, then why do they deserve your vote? If we want different outcomes, we have to make different choices. We need to make a different choice, and that one is NDP. Liberal candidate Fred Hutton. <laughs> this is always the awkward part, uh, talking about yourself and why people should vote for you. But I think it, it goes back to what I've said to others, um, Adam, and your colleague Chrissy asked me, are there any surprise, anything, something would be, people would be surprised about me? There are no surprises because I've basically been sort of public all my life, but pr- in my private life has been my private life. But I've always prided myself on being honest and fair and balanced as a journalist empathetic to try to listen to people to help people I've, I've tried to do that through my whole life those are values that my parents instilled in me and I don't plan to be any different as an MHA than I was in my previous life and it's an opportunity there will be in a general election have have your MHA and your premier in your district and in a couple of years time if you don't like it say goodbye all right thank you Thank you all for this today, uh, spending thank the lunch you. hour talking about some politics here. I will say th- independent candidate Daryl Harding, thank you. Uh, Tina Neary, PC candidate, thank you. EDP, Kim Churchill, thank you. Uh, Liberal Fred Hutton, thank you. That thank is you, it for the show. Thanks all. Uh, 
If you got thoughts on this show, folks, uh, give us an email, thesignal at cbc.ca. You can call the signal line and leave a message, 709-576-5260. Coming up tomorrow on the show, you know, we're going to talk about regional development. We're going to talk about communities uh, right across Newfoundland and Labrador. If you've got thoughts about what your community needs for regional development for, at the community level or something that your community is doing that's working, Get in touch with us. Uh, Until then, thank you so much for listening. I'll let the theme play it out because I got to get a bunch of people out of this studio. So thanks so much. Cheers.